Good morning. Uh, I woke up this morning and I, when I heard the rain pounding against the windows, I said, no one's coming to church today. So <laughs> I'm really glad to see you all. Thank you uh, for being here. Um, this week, um, we are starting a new forum series on the book of Acts. It's basically just going to be a Bible study on the book of Acts, and we're going to do it on Wednesday morning uh, in the Heritage Room, uh, next Sunday morning in the Heritage Room, and next Tuesday on uh, evening on Zoom. All three sessions are the same exact thing, uh, the same section, and uh, it's just whatever one works best for you. And if you come, uh, and I hope you do, and you wanted to be a little late on the first session, I'm going to fill you in. Uh, whenever I talk about a book of the New Testament, I almost always have to s bring up this issue because it's a major issue of the New Testament, but it's, it's something that's like invisible to us. Like we can't even understand how this was an issue because it's so different from our experience. And the, the issue is that in the first church, the first generation, there were two different groups of Christians, and they were pretty distinct. And they were the Christians, the followers of Jesus, who were Jewish, and there were the followers of Jesus who were not Jewish and had never been Jewish. Of course, the very first followers of Jesus, like the disciples, all Jewish, right? Jesus is teaching in the Jewish synagogue, he's hanging out in the Jewish temple, he's the Jewish Messiah, and those people, even after Jesus' death and resurrection, they had no concept that they were in a different religion. They, they weren't like, oh, I used to be Jewish and now I'm something else. No, like they were, I'm just doing everything I used to do, I just now also believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, in the book of Acts, the book of Acts is the story of the, the message of Jesus spreading outside of Jewish lands and beyond a Jewish population to people in Syria and Turkey and Greece and other places. And not only had these people never been Jewish, they probably knew nothing about it. Uh, to most of the Roman Empire, Judaism was a strange little religion practiced by a strange little country uh, in the uh, eastern Mediterranean. It, it wasn't something that was commonly known. They certainly didn't know the stories of the Old Testament. They certainly didn't practice uh, kosher dietary laws or keeping um, uh, circumcision or any of that. And so when you have these two distinct groups of people, these Christians, followers of Jesus, who are Jewish, and these followers of Jesus who are not, there was friction. And most of it came because the Jewish followers of Jesus said, hey, you can't just toss out all the Jewish stuff. You need to keep some of it. And so they argued about what needed to be kept. And there were major arguments, and there were uh, medium-sized arguments. And today's topic is one of the medium-sized arguments. Uh, and we see it in the uh, lesson from 1 Corinthians. And, and the, the issue is this. And this was not an issue in Jerusalem, in Israel at all. But everywhere else in the Roman Empire, if you went to the marketplace to get food, to get meat. Almost all the meat that would have been available in the marketplace had come from a pagan temple. The uh, animal had been ushered into the temple in front of the idol or the altar of the god of that temple. They dispatched the animal. Uh, they drained the animal, they cut the animal up, they put the meat on a platter, they did a wave offering where they uh, lift it up to the idol, and then the meat goes out to the marketplace to be sold. And it wasn't 100% of the meat available in the marketplace, but it was probably somewhere around like 95%, and it was absolutely the best meat that was available, because you always gave to your God what was best. If you had a sick little goat, like you didn't take it in, you just did that at home. Um, 
that could, you couldn't take that to the temple. So the question became, in these Gentile lands, where almost all the meat and all the good meat available for purchase in the marketplace had been offered in a pagan temple, could a Christian eat that meat? Or, by eating that meat, were they participating in pagan idolatry? So I want you all, just uh, by a raise of hands, do you think the New Testament says you can't eat that meat, or do you think the New Testament says you can? Who says no? The New Testament says you cannot eat it. One, brave person, two, three, how many of you say the New Testament says you can eat the meat? Much more of you. Okay, so here's the deal. You're probably used to me asking uh, trick questions, which is why you're all tentative about raising your hands. But this is the most untricky question because both groups raising your hands answered correctly. It depends on where you look in the New Testament as to what the New Testament says about eating meat sacrificed to idols. In Acts chapter 15, there's this huge meeting of the minds, uh, Peter, James, John, and the other leaders of the Jerusalem church, but also uh, Paul and some of his emissaries that had been bringing the gospel to Gentile lands. They come together for the first like council, the first big meeting, to decide, are we going to make the Gentile Christians practice super circumcision? And there's this huge argument, and at the end of the meeting, they say, no, we're not going to make Gentile Christians practice circumcision, but there's four things they need to do, and the first thing they say is, do not eat meat sacrificed to idols. First thing, don't do it. There's a, in the second chapter of Revelation, uh, there's a note to the church in Thyatira, and Thyatira is slammed because their people are eating meat that is sacrificed to idols. The answer is just like, no, you don't do it. But today's lesson from 1 Corinthians, Paul has a different and far more nuanced answer. So, uh, and he kind of comes from a position of reason, and this is basically his answer. He says, that God in that temple, with that idol and that altar, doesn't exist. It is a figment of someone's imagination. It doesn't exist. It's not real. And so that idol is an idol to nothing. It's not real. And so if someone comes and waves uh, their hamburger in front of a statue that represents nothing, it, who cares? You might as well wave the meat in front of a football or in front of a Chuck E. Cheese sign. Like, it doesn't matter doesn't exist, and so it's no problem for a Christian to eat that. He doesn't say this, uh, but he intimates it in another, in another place. Um, who made that animal? Did Zeus make that animal? Did Mithras make, make that animal? Did the god of that temple make? No, who made the animal? God made the animal. God made the animal, some silly priest waved it in front of a silly statue, so who cares you can eat the meat, no problem. No problem. Except, and this is where we get the nuance, he says there, are, there might be people in your community, in your church, who aren't able to make the mental distinction between eating the meat and practicing, and practicing idol worship in the, ten, in the temple. He's, he's like, we all understand that they're separate and you can eat the meat and you're not participating in it. But there's some people that grew up in that and they're not going to be able to separate the two. When they grew up eating that meat that came from the temple, it was like part of their devotional life. And so when they see you eating your hamburger, their faith is going to be injured. Perhaps even they're going to see you eating your hamburger that had been waved in front of the statue of Mithras, and they're going to say, oh, there's a Christian also practicing paganism. I guess it's okay 
to practice both. So Paul says, yes, you can eat it, but perhaps you shouldn't eat it. If you are going to hurt someone else, if you are going to confuse someone else, if you are going to damage or injure their faith, eating that hamburger isn't worth it. So, this is obviously a major issue for today. We're all worried when we go to ShopRite what little statue this steak was waved in front of, right? No, obviously this is not an issue. Like, you might not even have been aware this ever was an issue. Um, it's just not, it's not a thing today. And, and so you might wonder, why did the authors of the lectionary who assign lessons uh, for the Sundays, why did they include this? Like, couldn't they have maybe included something that's more relevant to today? And then the big question is, why in the world am I spending all this time addressing it? Isn't that a little embarrassing? Uh, shouldn't I deal with something that's a little more relevant for today? Well, here's the thing. This particular issue is over, done. But the way that Paul comes to his decision can still say something to us today. How he comes to it, the, his thinking behind it might be able to help us. This isn't our issue, but we have issues. This isn't our fight, but we have fights. How does Paul deal with this, and what might that say to us? So I just want to say three things. The, the first thing is that... Um, and we see this in other places of the New Testament, is Paul sticks up for his people. He goes to bat for his people. And his, I mean, his people are the people he's brought the gospel to. He does not want to lay anything upon them that is either going to make them think twice about following Jesus or make them want to leave Jesus. And so he is constantly fighting at great personal and reputational cost, he is fighting with the church in Jerusalem who always wants to say, yes, we're going to follow Jesus and we're going to follow all these customs we followed back to Moses. And Paul says, no. We're going to follow the stuff that Jesus talks about. Does Jesus talk about eating meat sacrificed to idols? No. So we're not going to worry about that. This gets him in hot water. Uh, there, there is great tension in the New Testament between Peter and Paul. They're at loggerheads uh, over this issue about how Jewish the Gentile Christians need to be. We see when Paul writes his letter to the Romans, he's writing to a letter to a church that he has never visited. He's never been there. He didn't found the church, but he writes the letter knowing that they've heard things about him, and he needs to make sure that they understand like, who he is from himself and not from other people who are going to say, he's a bad person, don't listen to him. His reputation was damaged in the ancient church, and he was willing to do that to stand up for the people that, that, he, that were around him and ha that he was fighting for. It's a beautiful thing. Um, it's a brave thing that Paul did to stand up. The second thing Paul does is Paul thinks deeply, prayerfully, faithfully. And in so doing, he thinks absolutely outside of the box that he grew up in and that everyone wanted him to be in. When he grew up as a Pharisaic Jew, absolutely, if you had asked him prior to his Road of Damascus experience, can you eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols? Immediately he would have said, no, absolutely not. If you asked Paul's mother if it was okay for, to eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols, it would have been no. If you asked his rabbi, if you asked his spiritual mentors, if you asked anyone in Paul's orbit before his uh, Christian, his experience of Jesus, they would all would have said instantly no. But Paul was willing to think outside of the box still staying inside the box of the Christian faith. Again, going back to that rubric, 
Did Jesus talk about it? Okay, if Jesus didn't talk about it, maybe it's not of central importance. And so now I'm opened up to say, this God doesn't exist. This statue is to nothing. They waved it in front of nothing so we can eat it. it it's also brave to think outside of the way that you've always thought to think outside of the way that you've been raised to think, to think outside of the way that everyone around you is thinking. I mean, sometimes you're wrong. Sometimes I'm wrong. Sometimes Paul was probably wrong. But he was willing to take that intellectual risk in order to stand up for his newfound friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. Which brings me to the third thing. And it's the most important thing, and it's foundational to the first two things I just said, and that is his foundational understanding, the, the foundation of Christian ethics. Like, how do we make decisions? If we have a decision to make, where's, what's the first thing we go to? His thing is, is it going to hurt other people? Yes, it's okay for me to do it, but if it's going to hurt somebody else, then it's not okay. He's, he's willing to question and throw out all the traditions that he had grown up with and probably taught himself, but he's not willing to dispense with the main teaching of Jesus, which is love your neighbor as yourself. And so I'm going to look at these neighbors, I'm going to love them, I'm going to stand up for them, I'm going to guide them into the teachings that Jesus has for them, and I'm not going to put things upon them that are going to damage them, hurt them, or allow them to damage other people. The first thing we ask is, is this loving my neighbor? And if the answer is no, then we have our answer. And so, you can eat your hamburger, but first, we love our neighbor. Amen.